Would I have changed anything that I have done? I will not change my actions. Um, I will not make decisions that aren't based on principles or the values that I have always um, embraced. That was Jody Wilson-Raybould speaking earlier in the show. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau doubled down on not apologizing for his role in the SNC-Lavalin affair. The Prime Minister says he accepts the Ethics Commissioner's report and takes full responsibility, but he disagrees with the finding that he inappropriately pressured Wilson-Raybould, his former Attorney General. Now it's time to hear from another key player in the SNC-Lavalin controversy. Jane Philpott is a former Liberal Minister, now Independent Ontario MP and candidate for Markham Stouffville. Hi, Dr. Philpott. Nice to see Hi. you. Hi. Thanks for making nice time for us. My pleasure. In your statement you released earlier, you raised particular concern about the fact cabinet confidence wasn't waived so that the ethics commissioner could access information from a number of witnesses who said that the information they had was covered by those confidences. Were you one of those witnesses? Well, uh, Vashi, uh, when the ethics commissioner reaches out to people, uh, they often will ask them not to even comment on whether or not they have been asked to speak. And so uh, it's not, not going to be even known to uh, Canadians who the ethics commissioner wanted to speak to that uh, wasn't available uh, to him. But I think the fact of the matter remains is that uh, there is potentially further information uh, related to this issue uh, for which Canadians are not uh, going to be given account. And uh, to give the confidence to Canadians that uh, the, we've gotten to the bottom of what happened, uh, I certainly think it's in the interests of the public uh, that those confidences be waived. Are you in possession of any information that you think the Ethics Commissioner should have had access to? Uh, there are pieces of information that I'm aware of that I'm not at liberty to speak about. And when you say you're not at liberty, in the in the context of, um, I guess, because in the past you've also said that there is other things that you want to talk about, but you didn't feel that you uh, that, that they weren't that they were. I'm sorry, that they are covered by cabinet confidences. You didn't feel that that you could speak about them. Is that is that this, a similar type of situation? Is that what you mean here? So what I would point to for Canadians is what the Ethics Commissioner said, is that he was able to get enough information to make a determination in terms of whether or not there was a, a breach of the Conflict of Interest Act or not. So it didn't, in a sense, uh, hold him back from being able to make a determination on this. Uh, but I would say that uh, I can affirm that there are pieces of information that I'm aware of, but that because of the oath that I made uh, to Queen and Country to keep in secret that which shall be kept secret according to the the oath that I made as a cabinet minister that unless I'm released from that uh, obligation that I, I I'm not at liberty to share those uh, pieces of information either with you or with the conflict of interest and in ethics at the at the time originally when when you said that that information existed but you didn't feel because of your oath that you could release it there were a number of people in the government who said you can you can stand up on a point of privilege. You can use another member's state, someone else's member's statement, or you can, uh, you know, speak with parliamentary with parliamentary privilege rather in front of one of the committees that was studying this issue. Why didn't you take any of those opportunities? Well, Vashi, it's very easy for other people to uh, to uh, think that they can simply release me, but I made a very clear oath at the time uh, that I became a cabinet minister. Uh, it, people can refer to the actual wording of the oath, but one of the things that it asks is that cabinet ministers hold in secret that which ought to be held in that regard. It's an oath that, uh, that we make on behalf of Canadians. Uh, we swear to the Queen uh, and uh, that we will hold those obligations and uh, I hold that uh, with the utmost seriousness and unless there is a clear indication that I'm free to speak then I, I would, cannot do so. The Prime Minister was asked about this yesterday specifically why weren't those cabinet confidences waived where the ethics commissioner is concerned and in part of his answer he alluded to the idea of a precedent of not wanting to set a, a precedent here. It, does he have a point if if those confidences are waived does it does it sort of set a tone by which people sitting around the cabinet table feel like they can't speak freely I would answer that Vashi by saying that Canadians need to have confidence that uh, they're uh, decisions that are made by politicians and in particular by uh, by the government um, are done 
uh, decisions are made appropriately, that people act appropriately, and there are times when uh, things need to be kept secret, uh, but as it relates to a matter like the, uh, the independence of the justice system, uh, as it relates to the particular issue that we're dealing with here, I think Canadians want to know that they've heard the full story, uh, and there's a certain amount of transparency that is obviously not uh, in, in, in existence at the moment, and that concerns Canadians. The Prime Minister yesterday, in his comments following the release of the report, said that he couldn't apologize for standing up for Canadian jobs. And I know that the end doesn't always justify the means, but can you not, I guess, envision a scenario where that was his motivation, that if he didn't do everything to try and save those jobs and they were lost, Canadians would turn around and say, you know, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you try to do everything to save them? Well, Vashi, I, I, you know, certainly wouldn't want to suggest that that wasn't the motivation of the Prime Minister, but that is not the issue that was at hand yesterday, and that is not the issue for which people were asking for an apology. Uh, we know now uh, with certainty on the basis of further information that became available yesterday that there were uh, attempts to interfere with the independence of the judiciary, uh, that there was uh, deliberate and inappropriate pressure made on the former Attorney General, and that there was a conflict of interest for the purposes of benefiting a private corporation. Uh, these are the kinds of things for which Canadians want an apology, I believe. Do you? I, I take your point completely, and I and I, I understand what the ethics, uh, what you're saying about what the ethics commissioner determined. Um, but the prime minister often speaks about his motivation, and if you say that you don't know for sure that that wasn't, what do you think he was motivated by? Well, it, it's. I don't think it's motivations that it, that concerns people so much as whether or not we hold in regard what is in the best interests of the country, and that we hold in regard the very pillars of what uh, our democracy is founded upon. And one of those pillars is that our justice system needs to be independent. And politicians who have the desire to further their political career, to ensure that they will win an election to potentially support those who may have supported them uh, financially and or in other ways. Those are not the kind of uh, those are not the kinds of motivations uh, that should uh, be on politicians' minds when it comes to uh, a, a criminal matter. And it's extremely uh, clear that politicians, the executive and legislative branch should not interfere with the judicial branch of government. Do you think, as the Prime Minister said yesterday, that the recommendations that came out of the McClellan report will achieve that? Well, the McClellan report, uh, I think, has uh, made some very good observations, and one of those is that in order for the system to work as it has been established in Canada, it requires the integrity of politicians. Uh, and I think Canadians are thankful that our former Attorney General upheld the highest uh, standard of integrity and would not allow any interference to proceed. And we certainly hope that, that the current and all future attorneys general uh, would uphold those same kinds of standards. Jody Wilson-Raybould yesterday used the word vindication in her statement. Do you feel vindicated? Well, I, I think I have mixed emotions. I indicated in my statement this morning that my overwhelming emotion in this is sadness, uh, that all of this had to take place from the very beginning. But there is a certain amount of uh, relief that the uh, conflict of interest and ethics commissioner was able to do his job, that he was able to impartially uh, report to Canadians as to uh, a number of actions that took place uh, over the last number of months. And he was able to, uh, in fact, determine that there had been a violation of the Conflict of Interest Act. So there is satisfaction that, that the, some of those facts are now available to Canadians uh, to uh, correlate with the observations that I had made previously. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Dr. Philpott. Appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. I'm not going to apologize for standing up for Canadians' jobs because that's my job, to make sure that Canadians and communities and pensioners and families across the country uh, are supported, and that's what I will always do. Uh, I disagree with 
uh, the uh, Ethics Commissioner's conclusions, but he is an officer of Parliament who's doing his job, and I fully accept his report. The issue here, and what was reflected in the Commissioner's report, is around our institutions of government, around ensuring that we uphold their independence and uphold the rule of law. That was what I was doing. Welcome back. The fallout continues from that scathing report released by the Ethics Commissioner yesterday that found the Prime Minister broke ethics rules when dealing with former Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould and the SNC-Lavalin affair. Opposition MPs are calling for an emergency meeting of the Ethics Committee to further investigate the Ethics Commissioner's comments that he wasn't able to get all the information he needed on the file. Will the Prime Minister's assertion that he accepts the report but won't apologize be enough to quell voters' concerns, or is further investigation needed? It's time for the Power Panel in Toronto. Tonight, Tim Murphy is former chief of staff to Prime Minister Paul Martin, now with Macmillan Vantage. Beside him, Melissa Lansman is with Hill and Knowlton Strategies and also in Toronto, of course. Andrew Thompson is chief of government relations for University of Toronto and a former Saskatchewan finance minister. He's just down the road from them in Toronto as well. <laughs> and here with me in studio is the CBC's <laughs> national affairs editor and host of The House, Chris Hall. Hi, everybody. Hello. Nice to see you. A few things to go over. Let's start with uh, Chris, the call from uh, conservatives for an ethics committee. They actually got that wish grant. The, the Ethics Committee will meet, meet next, week. next week, but that doesn't necessarily mean an investigation. Right, they'll have a meeting to discuss whether they should hold a full meeting. And right. of course, if you look at the NDP's letter in particular, Charlie Angus wants to call Bill Moore. Now he wants to call the Prime Minister. Um, given what we saw in the past with this, well, this is a different committee, but with the way the Justice Committee dealt with some of these things, uh, it's unlikely that I think that the Liberals would reopen this in a full to full extent. They'll get their airing. They'll hear their side of uh, uh, the opposition side of it. Uh, but I'm not expecting a great deal will come out of it in terms of being able to call other witnesses to probe this more deeply. Tim, I want to get to some of the things that Jody Wilson-Raybould said in our interview that we hadn't heard before. But first, I just want to ask you about the prime minister's sort of doubling down on not apologizing. He spoke out again, said something very similar to what he said yesterday. A lot of attention being paid by his critics to the fact that he didn't just come out and say, I did something wrong. I accept wholly <laughs> the findings of this report and I'm sorry. What do you make of that? Well, I think there are a couple of things, one of which is, um, you know, there's a question of motivation and then there's a question of what the, uh, the proper considerations in governing around issues like this. So I think, A, he's saying from a motivation point of view, he was always well motivated. And the point was to protect, you know, an important Canadian company, Canadian jobs in a context of trying to find a solution where international competitors were finding those kind of solutions for their companies and we were not here to protect jobs. And opportunities. So he's saying fundamentally, I was motivated by the interests of Canada and Canadians and jobs and I'm not going to apologize for that. Um, secondly, I think there's an important issue at, at you know, that clearly, that, look, the Ethics Commissioner came to a conclusion about what the scope uh, in his view of the proper discussion was with the Attorney General and I find it quite amazing that he was as definitive as he was in the context of something that has literally never been dealt with before in the Canadian context and about which there was considerable dispute among lawyers as to what the appropriate scope of. And in fact, we had a very considered report by Anne McClellan on this issue in which she talked about in her report how it's appropriate to have consultations with the Attorney General around issues of policy. So I think he's saying, I, you know, fundamentally there is a dispute around what is the proper functioning of the Attorney General and the Justice Minister and, he, Minister, and he disagrees with the conclusion of the Ethics Commissioner on that. But at the end of the day, it, the report is the report. He's going to have to live with it politically, but he was always well motivated in the interest of Canada and Canadians. The, the and report, jobs. though, Melissa, didn't just address the motivation, didn't just address the, the part that Tim's talking about insofar as, you know, the ethics commissioner saying, no, you can't talk at all about this because the uh, public interest is inextricably linked to the private interests of SNC. It also talked about the way in which he went about it and said that that was unethical, that, it, you know, he tried to bend the will unduly of, of former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould. The report was both clear and, uh, and, and frankly scathing uh, in terms of his conduct as Prime Minister. And I think you'll see time and time again uh, clips of him coming out on the first day and saying the Globe and Mail report is false. And we all know that from the report not to be true anymore. And I think more fundamentally what this does is it puts the Prime Minister at the centre of all of this. Uh, and it's, it's incredible brand damage, sustained brand damage, you know, since February that sort of dissipated 
started, and now we have it again. And that's a real big problem going into an election uh, for the prime minister because the liberals' only strategy is the brand of the prime minister. It's not policy, it's not promises, and it frankly is not platitudes. It is him, and he is damaged from this. Is it that damaging, though, Tim? Uh, sorry, not Tim, uh, Andrew, uh, because I keep going to the point, I mean, when the prime minister does insist that the motivation was to save Canadian jobs, I feel like there is a large segment of the population who, imagine the reverse, imagine those jobs were lost, would say, you know, why didn't you do everything possible to save the jobs? Like, is that a convincing argument enough so to quell uh, the brand damage? And I do take the point on the ethical issues and the, you know, condemnation from the ethics commissioner twice that uh, there is damage to the brand. But is it enough to sort of blunt the damage? I don't think that the Prime Minister has handled this properly yet again. And this is what I find particularly odd about the, the strategy that they're using is they're back to the same failed arguments that they tried a few months ago that led to months and months of pain for this government when what people really want to hear is the Prime Minister offer a bit of contrition, admit that he uh, was wrong on the approach, and that uh, what he had said was, uh, was simply not the right way to go at it. And he's learned from it and moved on. He's been for whatever reason, unwilling to say this for months now, and he's stepping on the same set of rakes all over again here. So I'm not sure that that is, uh, is going to be a winning strategy for him. As to the question of would Canadians be upset if the opposite had happened, I mean, the company is still in existence at this point. Yes, the share price is down. They've not made a compelling argument, and in fact, Dion in his report is pretty clear that there isn't much of an argument to be made. Uh, for the deferred prosecution agreement that rests on economic interests of one particular company. So I don't think that there's an argument here that he has landed on yet that really serves, uh, serves his cause or certainly uh, will help the Liberals uh, as they go forward. Can I pick up on something that Tim said? Uh, I, I don't want to get into uh, motivation in the sense that I think the Prime Minister uh, has to represent the public and he can make his decisions about the best way to do that. But what we did learn from the report is that SNC-Lavalin was a driving force behind this deferred prosecution mm -hmm. agreement being inserted into the budget implementation bill. Mm -hmm. We understood that they hired two uh, former Supreme Court judges to provide legal opinions. There was no line between the Prime Minister's office, it appears anyway, and SNC-Lavalin when it came to this specific issue. So the motivation of the Prime Minister might have been to save jobs, but he was certainly, uh, and people around him were being lobbied extensively that there had to be an exception for this company, uh, despite its behavior and despite the fact that it was facing allegations of bribery. And when it comes to, to Anne McCollum's report, that's more of a, academics have weighed in on this, former attorneys general and the like. And it is a, a, a framework, a template for how the attorney general and the minister of justice should work together and how people should be more aware of what the function is. But, but in the end, it can't get away from the fact that Jody Wilson-Raybould said she felt that, that the lobbying was improper, that this had to stop and yet it didn't. And interestingly, she said just a few minutes ago that she wasn't aware, actually, of the extent. I mean, yeah. that is what's new in this report. Like, I wasn't, we knew that the lobbying was there. There's public records for that. Yes. Uh, we didn't know that, for example, they went to the Minister of Finance's office and asked for it, or pitched the idea first right. for the uh, the DPA to be included in the budget implementation bill uh, in 2018, and, and that's what ended so, up So these are the issues but, that I think that people, and, and I'm sure Tim's going to want to get into this. My point here is that, you know, whatever the motivations were, this was a company that was working very hard behind the scenes, had incredible access to the Minister of Finance's office and to the Prime Minister's office in order to make that case. And even though Jody Wilson-Raybould said, you can't continue with this pressure, it did continue, and largely it was because of what they were hearing from SNC. And I do want to get everybody in. Sorry, I, I'm going to get you in. i got to take a break. I'm so sorry, but we want to get everyone in on that point. We'll pick up right after that break. More Power Panel after this. Welcome back to Power and Politics and the Power Panel with Tim, Melissa, Andrew, and Chris. Uh, we are talking, of course, about the continued fallout from the Ethics Commissioner's report released yesterday on the SNC-Lavalin controversy and particularly uh, the Prime Minister's involvement in it. That Ethics Commissioner determined that the Prime Minister had contravened, had broken the Conflict of Interest Act. Right before the break, we had been talking about what Jody Wilson, some of the things Jody Wilson-Raybould said surprised her in that report. Among them, Tim, uh, and I'll start with you, was uh, what Chris had touched on the fact that the extent to which SNC was involved in uh, pitching the DPA and ultimately its implementation. And as well, she said she didn't know that the, the, the officials in the Prime Minister's office had gone and sought the opinion of former Supreme Court justices prior to suggesting to her that she do the same. What did you think of that? Uh, it doesn't really fuss me. I, I think a couple of things, one of which is I think it's 
um, you know, kind of unsurprising that in the course of looking to implement uh, a deferred prosecution agreement, that uh, uh, mechanism that uh, that company was talking to a bunch of different people in government. In fact, I thought I saw from her interview that she didn't back away from the notion that even dis in the face of that, she still thought it was an okay idea for that uh, law to be on the books and to be available in the right yeah, circumstances. She wouldn't really answer the question when I said, well, would you, ch would you not have attached yourself yeah. to it yet? Yeah. yeah, and so, I mean, I take that as basically her admission that the law is fine to have and she wasn't going to, at the end of the day, she thinks uh, she obviously had a problem with being talked uh, to about it in the context of SNC-Lavalin, but not the principle of it being on the book. So what about I, the greater you know, optics, though, of SNC saying, hey, Ministry of Finance, introduce this with the budget implementation bill, and then they do? I mean, just like optics for uh, where Canadians are concerned, not where Jody Wilson-Raybould is. Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, it's, you know, I mean, it was discussed in the committee uh, by the members of parliament of all parties who all actually spoke to the fact that it kind of made sense as a good idea to have in the law. Uh, the fact that they chose that mechanism versus another doesn't really bother me or make uh, that much difference. I think the fact that people got a chance to speak to it in parliament and thought it was a good idea is the important point. And so that we had public uh, debate about it, about how to uh, proceed with this kind of arrangement, and it got the approval of parliament. Melissa, does Tim have a point there? Well, I know that Tim doesn't seem fussed about this, but it's it's more than optics. It's actually reality. A private company walks into a minister's office and decides, you know, how they want the law to be structured. And any Canadian would think that there's a problem with that because we have a system, uh, you know, by which laws are put forward, and they're not put forward by SNC well, uh, or any, or frankly, oh, or sorry. any private company. Uh, and on the jobs argument or the economic argument, you've heard time and time again from SNC saying that there, you know, there was no such thing as 9,000 jobs, because we haven't heard the Prime Minister say that since. There was so, sort of, you know, no threat of them leaving Quebec. So to fall back on this same argument, you know, after losing on it in, in February, I just don't understand that. I don't know how you can sit there and say, I'm not fussed about this or nobody's listening, because this is damaging to your brand. So is this I appreciate Melissa's, you know, a, a high-mindedness on it, but this is what we do as lobbyists. <laughs> and to somehow believe that that's not what we do, that we don't, as registered lobbyists, put forward the views of the folks who employ us uh, to ministers and whoever will listen, uh, simply is you know, not, uh, not the case. And I think that that is the, you know, where a lot of the conversation needs to move, and certainly where you see the NDP moving the conversation, is where should those lines be? The two pieces that I thought have been quite positive coming out of this in terms of the reporting has been, I thought Anne McClellan's report was actually very uh, refreshing. The fact that she has said the system works when integrity is, is present in the system uh, was very positive. And the second was Jagmeet Singh's call for a change to the way the lobbyists work so the lobbyists should not be allowed to intervene and lobby on behalf of clients on criminal issues. That's a really critical point. It should just be common sense. Any Canadian should would expect it. Should the onus be on the company or the lobbyists, or should it be on the government? It should be on the company and the lobbyists. I mean, it's, you shouldn't be lobbying for that kind of an outcome. But on the other hand, you shouldn't have a government that's receptive to it. In this that's case, what I mean. Like, should, should, should the onus be on the well, government but, to say, but, I'm but not receptive? But, but hang on, that's what, but hang uh, on. That's the, just let, actually let him finish, let him finish okay, first, and then I'll go you. Right? Well, certainly that's what uh, the, the, conflict, uh, of, uh, the ethics commissioner's report says, is that the failing here was at the Prime Minister entertaining uh, the idea. But there is, I think, also an argument to be said that really the rules for this type of lobbying should be changed to bring this up to what Canadians expect. Obviously, there will be lobbying. Registered lobbyists exist. It should be done transparently. But I think they need to be clear about kind of where those red lines are. Okay, response from Tim, and then I'm going to go to Chris. So, uh, so in fact, that's actually currently the case. It is transparent. People have to register quite aggressively. They have to tell who they're talking to about what subject matter. Uh, so it's all publicly available on the registry. Vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, and the reality is you can only lobby vis-a-vis -vis issues where the politicians have the scope to make a decision. If they don't have that scope, uh, then you're you know, you're yeah, kind of having a pointless conversation. And frankly, the, the reality is there is an exception around the way in which criminal 
uh, cases are conducted where lawyers can have conversations uh, with lawyers and clients with clients to settle a case and you need to provide the scope for that to occur but that's and not if what you restrict here. that but that is but hang on but the law actually allow the lobbying law allows for that and allows for the scope for that and if you take away that you're going to actually jam up the process of legitimately settling cases so you got to be very careful about the knee jerk dumb idea because uh, I think that's one. Okay, I feel, mean, I like, feel like it's a approach. I feel like it's a technical discussion, not about but and, and well, I, would, I wish I was smart discussion. enough to participate in that. But I'm not a lawyer. I just feel like I remember reading the report. I don't think anyone's naive, and they don't think SNC is lobbying or companies are lobbying the government. Okay, that's that's right. one thing. Correct. But for a piece of legislation, Chris, to be so specifically tied to the wants of one company who is facing crim which is facing criminal charges, not you know facing financial difficulties or some other issue that they needed to lobby it, but yeah. like criminal, serious criminal charges, so serious, in fact, the criminal, the director of public prosecution said, I don't want to proceed with a DPA. It just looks, uh, you know, I, I think it would yeah, raise I, eyebrows. I think the fundamental problem that liberals find themselves in today uh, is that SNC-Lavalin did have this access. I, I don't think they were doing anything illegal. Nobody seems to be suggesting when they were lobbying and providing legal opinions uh, to, to people in the prime minister's office, but it's the appearance that they have a special access. That's the first thing. And it was quite clear throughout that Kathleen Roussel, who's the director of public prosecutions, determined that SNC-Lavalin was not qualified to get a deferred prosecution agreement. And there was no ability, or at least according to Jody Wilson-Raybould, for her to, or any reason for her to go through this. And if you look through the, the Mario Dion's report, th there were efforts to try to portray the idea that, that Jody Wilson-Raybould hadn't done her due diligence when in fact she had. Uh, there was some suggestion that she was, was not open to options, not only on this case, but she was difficult to deal with on almost anyone. So in the end, What's the issue here? The issue is that SNC-Lavalin wanted something that they didn't get it, and the government is now caught, or the liberals are now caught, looking at how did this get out of control and how do we put the genie back in the bottle when we're coaching an election campaign, and it looks as though the prime minister was really trying to help a company beyond the broader principle of whether a deferred prosecution agreement is a good thing in the law or not. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video. Thanks for watching.